Hey, my name is Matt Storr and I repair saxophones for a living and today I would like to talk to you about the Con 28M Constellation alto saxophone. That's a Constellation with two N's, C-O-N-N, -N, just like Con. Um, it's a similar thing they did with the Con 26M and 30M Conqueror. Um, you will notice that this is a slightly different looking con than most of the vintage cons that you'll see. And also, I will say that it has been a long time since I've done a repairman's overview like this because I've kind of done most of the major vintage saxophones, um, except the Mark VI, which I'll never do because there's a ton of information out there already and I don't think I've got anything to add. Um, so I am a little bit rusty on this. I've got a different camera. My old setup is no longer usable, so I'm kind of like... <laughs> like playing horsey with my tripod and reaching around it uh, so you guys can see. And hopefully this ends up being okay. But So, the Con 28M Constellation. It's a really interesting saxophone. Uh, it is very different from other cons, and it is a bit of an oddity. Uh, it was made from 1950 to 1952. It is really Con's last... Uh, full-throated attempt at a professional saxophone and you know even the full-throated part of it I think is arguable uh, while you've got a complete redesign of the instrument the bore is different the key work is different um, you'll notice it's got a double socket neck underslung octave key but it has no micro tuner this instrument has no pivot screws, meaning like on long rods like this and there's another video I'll link to in the bottom where I use these rods um, I actually take it apart and show it for an example for something else, but usually there'll be two small screws that look like, let's see, um, on a con, they would look like this, right? And there'd be one at either end of the key holding it in, um, and the rod in between would be solid. On these, every single key is held in by a hinge rod, so there's a long screw in there. And on these, they're actually, they've got like a bearing surface on either end, and then they're machined down in the middle. They've got like this long waist. And I guess the idea was, um, I mean, if you look at a vintage ad for this, and you can pause on this screen, and you should be able to go ahead and read uh, what this says. Um, I'll bring it a little closer. But you can see completely new mechanism features live power in all keys through uniform direction and travel, natural spacing, and specially designed long light springs, um, long cross hinges down at the bottom. So, I mean, I guess they were trying to, I guess that they thought that made it feel better. Although it's, it's hard for me to really tell the difference between how this feels right now and how it would feel with pivot screws. Um, it doesn't feel particularly different to me. Although the instrument as a whole feels extremely slick. If you ever play one of these, the lightness of action is really noticeable. And I think that primarily that has to do with other decisions they made. Like if you watch the side B flat here, actually better the side C, you can see it travels on this fulcrum here and then right here, There's a long rod that makes the side C go. But you can see that these all go the same direction and the same distance. And they're fairly far from their axis, so you've got a lot of leverage. So this is a very light action for what is still a fairly strong springing on these side keys so they don't flop open. Um, and that's actually, that feels really, really great. But I think they could have done that without those long uh, hinge rods. Um, another thing that they've got on this instrument is, let's see if I can find a good spot to see them. They've got adjustment screws for most adjustments, both the relationship between like the B and the C sharp here and the height. It's kind of hard to see in the back there, right there, uh, for key heights as well. And you'll notice I used primarily cork on this instrument. The way they had this designed is that you can use just a few different thicknesses of cork on the entire instrument and then use the adjustment screws for the rest. Now in a few spots I used, like you can sort of see, 
down here. Those are actually the adjustments for the bar key. The bar is in front. I used synthetic materials there because there was too much squish. Um, but mostly I used cork and felt as this instrument was originally designed and it feels great and it's very firm. And I think that that's part of what they were doing as far as the key design was making sure that the instrument could feel really firm and tight even with the somewhat relatively squishy materials that are available to them then, namely natural felt and natural cork. Now today we've got you know, synthetic cork that people can use and I use that a bit, um, but that can actually be like a bit hard sometimes especially on an instrument like this that was designed to make squishier materials feel firm. If I use synthetic cork on a lot of these places, the instrument will become very loud. So um, the tone of the instrument is also different from other cons. Now, the actual, and you can sort of see, I mean, if you're familiar with like a con 6M, you can look at these tone holes and see that they are visibly like a different size than on the 6M. So if you're sizing pads or resonators, both the key cups and the tone hole sizes are different than on a 6M, which as they said in the ad, is a new in bore and tone from tip of mouthpiece to rim of bell. The entirely new bore gives musician a modern tone quality that is clear and radiant. And actually I find that to be true. Um, while this instrument has the uh, size of tone of a con that you might be used to, the tone of it is actually significantly different. It's quite a bit clearer. Um, it's quite a bit more, I mean, I would say bright, uh, but that might be misconstrued as saying like sort of piercing. It's not got a piercing tone. It's just mm, more well-defined and it's really kind of like punchy um, and somewhat bright and it can really fill up a room. And one of the things that I find noticeable about this instrument when you're playing it is that the intonation is really, really excellent. And that might be due to, at least in the second register, the fact that it has three octave pips, right? So you've got one on the neck here and then two on the body. And a pretty ingenious mechanism to make that feel really, really light. Now, this is not the only place you'll ever see more than one octave pip. And the reason for that is, um, the reason for more than one octave pip is that ideally, just like if you're playing harmonics on a, on a guitar, you touch the string in one place and then pluck it and it will go up one harmonic, right? Ideally, you would interrupt the bore with a pip in a specific place for each different note, right? Um, and that's how you would get the clearest and most acoustically perfect octave. But because that mechanism would be excessively complex, we usually just have two octave pips on a saxophone. And that's why like your G sharp or your D, the parts of the range that the octave pip is responsible for at the extreme ends, intonation and tone suffers a little bit, particularly on like low D or oh, sorry, middle D. Um, and having two octave pips on the body helps that out quite a bit. Now these pips are very, very small. And if you're overhauling this, you really have to clean these out. I actually used a pentagonal reamer and was just very, very close or very, very careful to not actually take away any metal material, but it had some sort of calcium buildup in here that I had to get out um, that pipe cleaners are even just like the wire in the middle of a pipe cleaner is too thick to fit in there. Um, so that's something to be aware of, but that extra octave pit really does, in my opinion, help intonation in the second octave. And when I'm playing this, I can just concentrate on filling up the instrument and every note just comes out like it's on rails. Um, flexibility does suffer a little bit. If you're used to the flexibility of say a Con New Wonder Series 2 and you switch to this, you're gonna notice that this has much more of like a, almost like Yamaha feel to it where everything is really kind of like blocked in. Um, not to say you can't bend pitches, it's just not quite as easy on this instrument as on other cons. So again, quite different from other cons. You'll also notice this giant plastic key guard. Now this is an acrylic, um, um, I, you know, replacement by a guy named Matt Slauson up in New York, and he does an excellent job. This is thicker and uh, looks just as good, if not better than the original. These tend to crack over time, especially around these screws. You can see there's not really much like padding or anything. They're just sort of attached there. And that can make finding a case for this instrument difficult because resting on this, even if it falls inside the case, crack, this thing is gonna split. 
for a long time that was a major issue, but Matt's replacements are just so excellent um, and so readily available that if you own one of these, I would recommend getting one or two just to have around. Now this is the original. You can see it's got the same pattern that Matt put in there as all the, the paint is worn off on this. And you can see these sort of like spidery cracks coming out from each of the holes, and that's extremely common. This is actually considered to be complete and in very good condition. Um, but even then, I, this is not something I would trust to daily usage. Another thing you'll notice is that the shape of this here is like slightly different than the one that Matt made. Just ever so slightly. And the key heights for the low B and B flat are determined by the bumpers going up against this key guard. So if you get a replacement or if you even switch out one to the next, um, you may find that your key heights need adjusted um, or those felts might need adjusted. Um, and that's not that big of a deal. Just something to be aware of that if, you're, if you buy one and then you know plug it in, your key heights might be different. Your left hand pinky table might be out of adjustment. Speaking of the left hand pinky table, You'll notice it's somewhat unusual with the C sharp being a very large touch piece, the B there in the middle, and then the low B flat is just a roller on that side or a touch piece down here. And it takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, for me, most instruments I can just sort of pick up and play. And within a minute or two, I've got about as much technical facility as I have, which is not a great deal um, compared to my customers. But I, in other words, I don't really have issues with it. But the keyboard of the 28M is just a bit different than most other instruments, and it takes a little bit of getting used to. Once you do get used to it, it is fantastically quick. And really, really light, um, but like these really small palm key touch pieces take a little bit of getting used to. And the angle of the keys takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, these touch pieces are nice and flat, and I really like the way they feel. They don't feel like a normal con, though. So if you, again, if you pick it up feeling like a normal con, it's not going to be. The E flat and C are these nice sculpted pieces, but they're at somewhat of an unusual angle compared to the lower stack. Um, the chromatic F sharp is actually around the back of the instrument. And the way this travels feels a little bit different compared to going this way, usually or sometimes this way. Going this way feels a little bit different. Same with the side keys. Their direction of travel is different than you might be used to. Um, it's got a sculpted front F, which in my experience on these instruments, the Altissimo is just so super easy and really well in tune. And again, that might be due to those octave pips, but even for like playing Altissimo where I'm not using the octave key or where it doesn't seem to have much of a difference or playing overtones like low B flat and then just playing overtones up as high as I can go. Uh, they're all just fantastically in tune and really come out easy. Um, let's see. The double socket neck is something to be aware of. I've got a video on that. I'll link down below as far as key fit and stuff. Um, there's also this weird G sharp mechanism. Let's see if you can see it in here. See that weird like nickel silver tube? So G sharp is like, it's got this strange torsion mechanism um, where, so that's what happens if the G sharp is held down. It's kind of hard to explain. And then on the back, it's got this weird little key down here with adjustment screws that you bring up to meet the C sharp and the B to cause your G sharp to be automatic um, when you're playing low notes. But it's kind of a weird system and just make sure you take extra careful look at that before you take it apart. Um, let's see. Yeah, as far as the instrument itself, it's really interesting. I mean, you can see that the engraving is not particularly, you know, uh, ornate. Um, it is well done, but very simple. And you can see like right here, those sort of like striations and marks there. Um, that's like some, I mean, that's kind of like an error at the factory that this is not smooth here. When this got drawn up and then buffed, it just isn't smooth. And 
kind of as a last gasp of professional instrument making from the con saxophone uh, department, some of the things that, you know, I tend to like pre-war cons, some of the things that make me like pre-war cons are evident here. The metal's a bit soft, um, the quality of key work seems to be variable from one to the next, but the instrument itself plays fantastic, and I really, really like these. You don't see them too much, about only 10,000 were made, um, but if you find one, be aware that these long rods can be really, really difficult to get straight to get right. This instrument was in pretty good shape when I got it, um, but still, these were bent a bit, you know, they get knocked while they're in the case, or the body gets bent, and getting these things straight and having everything be free of play, um, but also completely smooth, is really difficult. And that takes up quite a bit more time than fitting a pivot screw. And it's all long rods, right? So a lot of your time fixing an instrument like this is going to be spent, if you want it to be mechanically tight, um, getting these long rods fitting correctly. Because like I said, you know, this is one, this is one, this is one, this is one. They're all rods. Um, the action, when correct, is very, very light and super even. Everything has pretty much the same spring tension. They actually designed it that way. If you look at the springs, they're all very long, um, and it just feels fantastic. Getting that octave mechanism to be correct and tight can be a little bit of a chore, and getting the double socket neck uh, to fit well can be a bit of a chore. And of course, you may have to, um, a lot of times these posts here are damaged. They're pushed down into the body. Getting those aligned and out so that it fits a key guard correctly can be a bit of a chore. Um, but if you do take the time to take one of these and restore it, uh, the reward is for a very unique and extremely well-playing instrument with excellent intonation, um, unique but excellent feel under the fingers, great altissimo, and uh, a really nice clear projecting voice that I would... Um, probably compare favorably to, and this this uh, will have limited utility to most people, but a Holton Stratodyne, which is one of my favorite horns. Uh, it feels a lot like a late Mark VI alto in its projection and power, um, with a bit more of a velvety tone than that. Um, but yeah, something that I think is entirely worthwhile uh, of your time and energy, if you find one of these to, to fix up. Um, just there, a unique beast and something that you can't just toss at any you know repairman and expect them to know uh, what's going on because not many people have seen them and probably not many people have had the opportunity to spend the amount of time one of these needs to get fixed up right. Um, they like thin pads. I used flat resonators on this one. The key heights are originally designed to be somewhat low so if you get a big giant domed resonator in there you're going to be taking up tone space you're going to have to open it up more um, which means you might be bending keys. Um, yeah, and these long rods here, you really have to use more lubricant than you're used to because a lot of it is going to be empty space with that machine down waste in the middle. So if you just put a bit in here and then insert your rod, it's going to all get you know put in the first little bit and the rest of it will be dry. So use a bit more lubricant than usual on those wasted rods. Um, wasted is in W-A-I-S-T. Um, and I guess that's about it. Hopefully you found that useful, helpful, informative. Uh, hopefully it was not too rough of a video. Like I said, I haven't done a repairman's overview in quite a while. Um, thanks for watching.